Okay, well, let's, uh, let's start. So, first of all, thank you everybody for, for joining us today on um, kind of the official kickoff or the announcement of the concept of uh, the CAN card, uh, a card that we'll be uh, launching in November. Uh, my name is Bill Griffin. I'm media lead for the Center for Medicinal Cannabis. Um, but the, the CAN card is really uh, the brainchild of uh, Carly Barton. Uh, Carly is joined today by um, some esteemed, esteemed panelists. Uh, I'll run through everybody's bios now before we, uh, before we start the main, main presentation. So, Carly uh, was the first person in the UK to receive a prescription for herbal cannabis privately uh, since the law changed in 2018. After not being able to sustain the costs of this, she worked tirelessly with government organizations in order to progress the NHS prescriptions. Um, and she's been involved in many projects that seek to establish wider access to medical cannabis in the UK, uh, most notably launching uh, Carly's Amnesty, uh, which set the stage for the CanCard. Um, this was a collaborative project and which has seen Carly connect with high level police officers, uh, doctors, patients and MPs, uh, representatives of which are joining Carly today. And we have um, Crispin Blunt MP. Uh, Crispin is a Conservative Party politician and MP for Reigate. He served in the Shadow Cabinet with briefs including trade, energy, security, counterterrorism and both as Minister for Prisons and Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. He is the current co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group uh, for Drug Policy Reform and in January 2019 he set up and launched the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group. And the objective of which is to promote evidence-based drug policy reform in the centre-right. He is currently the group's unpaid chair and chief executive officer. And representing uh, the police today, we have um, Detect Detective Chief Inspector Jason Q, who's just joined us now. Welcome, Jason. Hello, Bill. Thank you. Apologies for being late. No, no problem at all. No problem at all. Uh, so Jason is Thames Valley Police Lead for Drugs, Exploitation and Harm Reduction. And Jason is serving Detective Chief Inspector and he's seconded to the Home Office as the South East's Heroin and Crack Action Area Coordinator. Uh, and Jason's uh, colleague, uh, Simon Kempton, who is a serving Dorset Police Officer, an Operational Policing Lead. Uh, Simon joined Dorset Police in 2000 and has worked in Frontline Response Officer, both as a constable and as a sergeant, uh, where he gained qualifications as a licensed search team leader, hostage and crisis negotiator. He's worked in covert policing, surveillance and counter-terrorist policing. And Simon is also a member of the National Board of the Police Federation for England and Wales, for which he is the treasurer. And finally, rounding up the, uh, the panel this morning, we have uh, Dr. Leon Barron. Uh, Dr. Leon Barron is, the, is a London-based GP and founder of the Primary Care Cannabis Network. Uh, this is a platform for dialogue, debate and education to help strengthen the voice of UK GPs regarding medicinal cannabis. And his interests within general practice include mental health, managing the complex symptoms uh, that combine physical, psychological and social components. Um, he undertakes regular NHS work and is a tutor for undergraduate medicine at the University College of London. So thank you all the panelists for joining us today. Uh, so the format for this morning, um, first of all, uh, Carly will give a, an introduction to Gankard and then each of the other panelists will say a few words um, on their thoughts of this uh, proposal or this concept. Um, and then we'll open up for a Q&A session, uh, at which point, if you could uh, raise your hand, you should have a little hand icon at the bottom of, uh, of the screen, or uh, mention your question in the chat, and then we can open your mic and you can introduce yourself, 
and your organization and um, who you'd like to ask the question to. So thank you. Without further ado, I'll pass you into the very capable hands of uh, Carly Barton. Thank you, Carly. Legend. Thanks, Bill. Thank you and hello everyone and thanks for joining us. Um, as Bill touched upon, um, I was the first medical cannabis patient in the UK. I, I used cannabis to treat a uh, really chronic, horrible, nasty uh, neuropathic pain, which sees my brain misfiring pain signals all over my body, which it has done since I suffered a stroke in my 20s. I, uh, I lived on really heavy opiates, so fentanyl, which is 50 times stronger than street heroin, morphine, benzos, barbiturates, all kinds of, of drugs that were, that were given to me to, to try and help me manage the pain, none of which did anything until I found cannabis and had a massive aha moment. And, um, and it, it always feels, it's, you know, it's an honor to be here, stood without my stick, without a wheelchair here today. And, and that's because I've consumed cannabis in, a, in a, an inhaler this morning. Um, so I've been um, championing access to, to medical cannabis since about 2015. Um, we campaigned heavily for the law to change. Um, the law changed two years ago, 2018, and essentially um, there have been some, some real issues in terms of, of getting the access, making the access fair. So NH the NHS are not providing cannabis prescriptions at the moment, and um, many patients are now accessing via private clinics, which is a step in the right direction. Um, but the consultations and the cost of the products are mean that only a handful of these patients are going to be able to afford the prescription. So those that can afford it can, can buy themselves clean medicine, but, but more importantly, they can buy themselves immunity from prosecution. Um, and with my work that I've been doing for all of these years with, with this patient community and, and with these people who are quite vulnerable people who've really been put through the mill and have been, uh, you know, have tried every drug in, and everything that they possibly can to be well. And they find that cannabis is the only thing that helps them pick their kids up in the morning or, or you know, do really basic things like lift a cup of tea, which seems, seems like a really simple thing, but it, it, it's life changing for so many. Um, those people at the moment, I think the biggest, apart from the access issue and apart from the fact that the majority of them can't afford to, to, buy, um, to buy a clean, safe medicine, the, by far the biggest issue at the moment is fear. Um, and, you know, I have, I work every day with these people and they, you know, and, and I get heartbreaking stories of um, interactions with police from patients um, whereby you know the police don't necessarily want to be put in this position but are sort of forced to to arrest patients and, and put them through the mill. And some of these cases are dragged on for months so if you can imagine the emotional distress that that's causing for the patient and for, the, for, that, for their family just over possession of medicine that if they could afford it they would be going and accessing through um, through a clinic. So CanCard was a bit of a four in the morning idea, as, as all of my ideas tend to come. And um, it was an idea to, to start building on the relationships that I, I'd already built with, with police to try and, uh, and MPs and doctors to try and bring all of that community together. Because at the moment, the way I see it is the patients are in fear, the police are frustrated, the GPs feel, feel like their hands are tied behind their back. Uh, and the MPs have, have done what they can do in order to progress the, the laws to open up access. So everybody has an issue that, that needs, they all need bringing together, I felt, to, to try and address this in some way. And, and I felt that CanCard did that. So CanCard um, is a holographic ID card, um, which is verified. Um, so, so anybody can get access to a CanCard if they fit the criteria for a private prescription. So the argument there is, is that, you know, if you fit that criteria for a private prescription, the question is, should you be criminalised if you can't afford to sustain it? And I think, hell no, you shouldn't. Um, so we've used exactly the same criteria that, um, that the private clinics use in order to decide if a patient is el eligible for a, for a, to try medical cannabis privately. Um, so those conditions are listed. They're up on the website, cancard.co.uk. 
And the way that it would work is the patient would um, check the eligibility criteria online. They would then um, submit their photo um, and um, their GP's email address. They can then give their GP a quick call and, and give their GP permission to conf just confirm their condition with CanCard. Um, GPs are quite used to doing that because it, you know, it's, there are a lot of forms and processes that go on for um, exterior companies to, to giving permission for them to access your medical records. We are just merely confirming with the GPs that the, that the patient has a condition that makes them eligible. Um, so we email the GP direct and say, does the patient have one of these following conditions? This is the criteria, do they meet it? The GP sends that back digitally and then we issue the card to the patient. Um, in terms of the work that I'm doing with the police working group, who are fabulous, of which we've got Simon and Jason here today, um, we are working on, so the GPs have designed and helped me build the, the GP arm of this and the police are doing the same in terms of how this would fit into their daily processing and, and arranging comms so that everyone nationwide knows that these things are going out and what to, what to, um, what to expect to look out for. Now we want to encourage the police to, to use discretion. In the event that we don't have a law change, of which you know that could take years, the only two things that we do have to help these patients is guidance and discretion. And that's really what the two, you know, the two building blocks of CanCard are. Um, so yeah, so so that's that's it in a nutshell. Um, the police, um, when the you know, if the police are presented with a card, the police should know about CanCard, they should know that that person is eligible for a private prescription and they should be able to feel confident in using their discretion and, and walking away and getting on with their day. Um, in the event that a, an officer doesn't, doesn't want to go with that line, we are providing a completely open source legal argument framework, which is available to all CanCar patients, which should help support the patient in the case that they end up in an interview room um, and should be a really quick easy way for any solicitor to pick the case up and get and get a simple possession case dropped um okay yeah so that's that's pretty much the me summing it up so back over to you bill thanks carly brilliant thank you very much um so i, I will i will introduce everybody in the in the order i i read through the uh, the bios uh, so next up will be um member of parliament uh crispin blunt thank you crispin Uh, Bill, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Carly, for uh, the work you put in on putting this scheme together. And uh, what I think is important to be clear is that uh, any proper analysis of uh, the CanCard scheme shows it to be completely congruent with the objectives of government policy uh, and indeed, of course, of the operational uh, capabilities of the police and indeed uh, the uh, the policing, uh, the style of policing that they would want to uh, to take part in. But we'll hear more of that from uh, Simon and his colleagues in a, in a moment. Uh, let me just speak to the objectives of, of government policy as I understand them. Uh, in 2018, the case of Billy Caldwell, uh, combined with that of the young man Alfie Dingley, both epileptic boys, pushed the government across the line in terms of recognising that there was a case uh, for medicine from cannabis. Uh, the government, uh, having uh, returned the medicine confiscated uh, from Billy Caldwell at the airport when he came in from Canada, um, then gave a special license for him to have his medicine returned, cannabis-based medicine, um, which stopped his epileptic fits. And then they asked the chief medical officer uh, to examine whether or not there's any benefit from uh, medicine from cannabis. And of course, it took her two weeks to review the general evidence around the world and come to the conclusion uh, that there is a significant benefit of uh, uh, medicine from cannabis, um, now being, uh, which has been uh, over half the countries of the European Union at the time and uh, half the states, the United States of America and many other countries uh, had already uh, legalized a process of enabling uh, patients to access the benefits of medicine from cannabis. And now, uh, the United Kingdom medical establishment were to a degree taken as by surprise by the uh, government's decision, 
and they had not prepared the regulatory and legal framework under which the supply of medicine from cannabis was to operate in the UK. Uh, they were asked to do so and by November produced a regulatory regime, um, which 18 months later, um, under the analysis, has not worked in a way that would enable ordinary people to access the benefits of medicine from cannabis. Um, uh, one of the organizations I chair, the uh, Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group, produced a very substantial uh, peer-reviewed academic you know, qualified uh, paper on uh, how the a market was operating for the supply of medicine from cannabis. And uh, very sadly, uh, most people who are using cannabis to address the symptoms of the diseases they have are still having to access it criminally. They're either getting it from their dealer um, or they are growing it themselves. And in, in those cases, putting themselves in uh, possibility of even more serious criminal sanctions. And uh, Carly's scheme, uh, the CAN card scheme uh, will enable the police and uh, the prosecuting authorities to be able to differentiate between those who have a diagnosed medical condition for which they are using medicine derived from cannabis uh, to treat those conditions. And we've uh, seen that there's obviously going to the, the list of conditions and there is a substantial number of people who uh, may have the benefit of that and to differentiate those from those who would otherwise be using uh, cannabis for recreational purposes, uh, which the government uh, intends uh, to continue to remain illegal. Uh, there's a wholly separate debate about the uh, merits and demerits of the prohibition of cannabis for recreational use, uh, but you, it's almost impossible to find a member of parliament uh, who does not accept that if you can uh, have your condition treated by medicine derived from cannabis, then uh, why shouldn't you be able to do that? And it's uh, what we don't want to do is find ourselves in a place where we have inadvertently criminalised millions of our fellow citizens um, and then invite the police um, to take the morally impossible position of then arresting and prosecuting uh, those people uh, simply for wanting to be able to treat their disease uh, with a medicine that we now recognise uh, does have benefits for them. Uh, we're in an uh, intervening phase, I should say, uh, whilst we sort the regulatory and the legal framework out about how people are going to be able to access the benefits uh, of medicines from cannabis. And CanCard is a really excellent way, uh, whilst uh, uh, the government and the uh, uh, medical regulatory authorities get on with making sense out of the uh, current regulatory environment, which doesn't work in the United Kingdom, doesn't enable access to all the people who have symptoms that can be addressed by medicine from cannabis uh, uh, to address it. And uh, many congratulations uh, to Carly and her colleagues uh, for the uh, emerging design of this. And let's hope uh, from the 1st of November, when it's launched, it then uh, uh, saves the police and the prosecuting authorities from a barrel load of trouble with people who are, uh, in the government's eyes, uh, no intention of being criminal at all, uh, but do, strangely enough, uh, want to treat the symptoms of their condition uh, with the medicines uh, that are available uh, to them. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for that uh, fantastic overview. Um, and you mentioned the uh, unenviable predicament that the police find themselves in. Um, so thankfully today we have two representatives from the police. Um, so. Next, I would like to invite uh, Detective Chief Inspector Jason Q uh, to say a few words. Hello, um, so I'm Jason Q. I'm uh, currently a DCI. Uh, I'm no longer attached though to the Southeast Heron and Crack Action Area uh, Coordinator role. Um, that, that ceased in, in April, just for clarification purposes. But um, I'm, I'm still a serving police officer and I've been very proud to work within this group. Uh, and I congratulate the, the, the inclusivity uh, of listening to lived experience so the the voices of people in pain severe horrendous pain every single day is compelling um, and you cannot help but listen to those voices uh, at the start of any policy making and i think it's really crucially important that policy makers uh, police officers or everyone involved in in any form of policy decision making has to listen to that voice because Ultimately, police or uh, practitioners involved in 
policing or enforcing certain aspects of the law can find themselves in a in a, in a very um, uh, difficult position. And I think we, in this context of med, uh, medicinal cannabis, we are dealing with uh, people in severe pain uh, that are being found in possession of a substance which is actually medically proven and prescribed to other people if you can afford it um, uh, uh, through the NHS. So whilst this this solution, the CanCard, is, is an excellent uh, method of informing uh, my colleagues uh, when they come in, when they come into contact with uh, uh, patients in possession of cannabis, it will help inform their decision making about how they can proceed with 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 this uh, incident or or event. Now, the context of police becoming involved, it might be a stop check of someone vaporising uh, uh, cannabis in in the street, perhaps. More often, it's someone in the home environment. But it's that sensitivity and the production of a card that will inform that decision making on the spot without the need for anything adverse such as an arrest or interview uh, and so on. We, we've seen and I, I have developed myself uh, drug diversion schemes which no longer require an arrest, uh, interview or even an admission of guilt and that's not just for cannabis that's for all substances. So we, we you know we're, we're far beyond the need of, of, of using um, a punitive approach to possession of what is uh, a, a health choice. Now, when you have a, a, a proven medicinal um, <clears throat> medication, such as cannabis in this situation, uh, the police have a, have a role to um, basically not, not, not increase that pain. You know, no one wants to see a patient in custody. That's, that's definitely not the role of the police. So the card is a brilliant mechanism now to, to help uh, my colleagues uh, dealing with um, situations they will face, not, and I absolutely congratulate the working group to come to this 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 um, uh, this conclusion. I think it's brilliant, and and also congratulate the the, the media reporting to to really sensitively and, and pragmatically destigmatise uh, the cannabis. So I think the public uh, perception of cannabis has changed considerably, um, <clears throat> as as mentioned by. Uh, 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 the MP Crispin Blunt a uh, minute ago with Billy Caldwell um, that was horrific uh, uh, reading in, in, in the media and no one wants to see anyone in pain uh, albeit a child and, and I think um, this will this will uh, uh, bring the conversation around treating people who use drugs with, with respect uh, and, and dignity that they, that they need so um, uh, this has my full support and I'm very proud to have been involved Thank you, Jason. Thank you for the, the view from, uh, from the side of the police. Um, and continuing that discussion, uh, I will now give the floor to uh, Simon Kempton, who is a serving Dorset uh, police officer. Interestingly enough, Simon is also a member of the National Board of the Police Federation, um, for which he is the treasurer. So maybe he has, has some thoughts on, on the kind of financial aspects uh, of this in, in policing. So. Laurie, no, you are, Simon. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And, and in fact, you mentioned that there is a, a financial aspect to this when we come to look at how the police spend our scant resources and, and where we put our efforts and where society would like us to put those efforts. Um, I probably want to start, though, by thanking Carly for including the police um, in this. I know traditionally, historically, there's been a tension, not with Carly, but with people who want to use cannabis and the police, clearly. Um, and I think the more that we can speak to each other, the more we can overcome those tensions and work together. And it's been a really good example of, of different groups coming together for a common purpose. Uh, and I think your energy and drive has been inspirational. So thank you for what you've done so far. Um, so why did I join the police? I joined the police to help vulnerable people. Uh, if I'm honest, I joined the police to lock up criminals. Um, I absolutely didn't join the police to arrest and criminalize people in pain and patients. Um, so what is a patient? Well, my medical knowledge and expertise goes as far as occasionally watching Holby City. So if a GP decides that somebody is in need of a particular medication, um, I bow to their knowledge and their experience and, and their training. But when I'm on the street and I, I come into contact with, say, Carly, um, how do I know that Carly is actually a patient 
maybe she's a recreational user and, and she's lying to me about needing medicinal cannabis. And at the moment, I don't have much more than face value and gut feeling. Um, and I want more than that. I want more information to help inform my next choice and my next decision. Because what, absolutely what I don't want to do is take Carly into custody if Carly is a patient who's just trying to access medication to control symptoms. And I think at the moment, CanCard could fill that gap. Uh, in the UK or England and Wales, um, police officers can use discretion. If I stop you driving a car without a seatbelt, depending on the circumstances, I can choose not to give you a ticket, but to give you some advice and a way we both go on our day. But I want something on which to hang my hat. And CanCard does that potentially. It lets me know that this person in front of me is legitimately using this substance to control symptoms or control pain. And that's gone through a medical process. And I think Crispin earlier actually mentioned um, this next point. There, there seems to be a, a deep inequity in the United Kingdom in 2020 when your access to medication depends not on your medical need, but your bank account. And that can't be right. And from my point of view and the job that I do, it can't be right that the police are then dragged into that inequity. My job is to protect the vulnerable and to lock up criminals. It's not to deal with people differently, depending on their access to funds. And I think possibly finally what I'd say is um, this isn't a, it's literally not a get out of jail free card. Uh, I mentioned discretion. Police officers will have discretion to actually, in these circumstances, I will have to arrest you because. So, you know, if someone's driving a vehicle and they're under the influence of cannabis. I don't care how many cards you've got. You know, I've got a wider um, role to protect the public or you who are using the roads so under those circumstances. Or if someone says, I've got a cannabis card and, you know, they're stood next to several kilos of, of cannabis. Well, I don't care. I will not use my discretion. So this isn't a get out of jail free card. This helps me to do my job and it helps to keep patients out of the criminal justice system. Um, and I think that has to be a good thing. And that's why um, I'm, I'm, I'm proud and I'm able and I'm, I'm confident to support this initiative. Thank you, Simon. That was a uh, very, very good words. Uh, very um, painting an uh, excellent picture of kind of in practical terms, how, how this card will be kind of a benefit to both patients and, and the police. Um, you, you touched a bit on there on the uh, medicinal side of, of cannabis, which is obviously what this is all about. So as a kind of a perfect segue into our final panelist, um, Dr. Leon Barron. Thank you, Leon. Uh, you, you're on mute, by the way. <coughs> there we go. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Excellent. Lovely. Or is First of all, thank you to everyone for, um, for the work you're doing. Thank you for including me within this um, panel discussion as well. So just to give everyone a little bit more about uh, my background. So um, I'm a regular NHS GP um, and I became interested in medical cannabis uh, several years ago when whilst some of the um, uh, media stories were coming through and I began to learn a little bit more about uh, the medical properties of cannabis really off, off my own back. Um, I then became uh, one of the founding members um, of the UK Medical Cannabis Clinician Society. So um, that's made up of a number of um, specialists and also uh, now we have a, a patient committee. We, um, we put together our own guidelines on cannabis and we've published um, several um, guidelines now for doctors within the UK. And I know that those are um, being used by a lot of the um, prescribers now in, in the UK, those guidelines. Um, so I'm, I'm very much involved with, with the UK MCCS group. Um, I've also set up some, really a project with um, a few GPs who share my interest in cannabis med as a med medical cannabis uh, called the Primary Care Cannabis Network. And that was really um, as a result of recognising that most GPs and the majority of GPs don't really know much about this subject yet 
um, we are the first point of contact for patients. And, um, and I saw that as, as an issue. So uh, I very much pitched it um, in terms of education. Uh, we provide um, uh, you know, a, a, a growing database of, of links into interesting um, resources for doctors. Uh, we host regular webinars and uh, seminars with interesting guest speakers. So we've just had a, um, a webinar with some GPs in the US and uh, North America who are prescribing for patients and hearing about case studies and so on. And so we, we've, we link up very much with other doctors, other organizations who are focused on education. Um, I think ultimately our aim is also to see um, GPs um, more involved in this conversation and um, I would personally like to see GPs as prescribers. I think it was an oversight not to allow GPs to, to prescribe. Um, and I think that's partly why we now have a two tier system. It's actually quite a complex discussion as to why this has happened, but there's various factors to consider. There's guide, nice guidelines, um, difference between NHS and private um, medicine. And unfortunately we do now have, have a situation where yes, there is um, uh, and sort of imbalance in access to cannabis, medical cannabis products. Um, I felt when Carly put this idea to me, um, I, I felt really it was a, it was a, an opportunity not to miss because I actually I think we really do need to now start to engage GPs and um, for them to understand that this is a subject that is growing now in conversation amongst doctors and patients. And um, you know I'd like to think that we can. Um, we can engage with the wider GP community and um, hopefully come on board with this and also continue to sort of build education and to make doctors feel more confident in understanding this, this, this role of cannabis as a medicine. And there's clearly a, there clearly is a role um, for, for me medical cannabis. Um, you mentioned pain earlier. There's, there's many other conditions that patients are now um, finding uh, um, that ca medical cannabis is of benefit and I think it's very hard to, to ignore this now, particularly when patients look around uh, the landscape here, and they may know people with similar conditions who are receiving private scripts, or they look across to Europe or North America, where essentially you can go and see your GP or uh, someone who has some specialist knowledge in cannabis um, prescribing, and you will receive a, a regulated, safe, clean product and uh, and I, I just cannot understand why you know we haven't sort of followed the same um, path here and why we've made it so difficult for patients to access these products so um so you know patients are at the heart of what we do um and i think you know i wouldn't want um i guess that's the the, the role of, of you know of what we do as doctors we we want to act in the best interest of patients it's very difficult to see what's going on um you know, in terms of access and that, yes, there are lots and lots of people who are using cannabis, self-medicating with street cannabis. A lot of doctors, understandably, will sh shy away from that subject. Um, and uh, there's still a lot of, there still is a lot of stigma in the medical community, but I do feel like we are advancing now and that actually it's becoming more acceptable to talk about this. And I personally believe that this is going to become um, more mainstream in time, the prescribing of medical cannabis. No. Okay, thank you very much, Leon. Uh, and thank you to all panelists. Um, it was a fascinating kind of journey through all different um, sides of this, uh, of this the concept of the, of the CAN card. Um, so I, I I have to apologize, I didn't invite, I didn't uh, introduce my colleague, uh, Victoria Logan. Uh, so Victoria is there with, uh, it's a CMC slash ACI. Uh, Victoria has done a fantastic job in coordinating uh, this event today. Um, and now we are going to open the floor to, uh, to your questions. Um, so to do that, you should have a, a kind of a little hand icon in the bottom, so you could raise your hand and then we can open your mic. Um, failing that, the chat seems to be working. Um, so if you could indicate if you have any questions. Um, so we, we do have some questions already. Ah, okay, so yes, they're from some Roshan. So Roshan uh, is sending these now through the, through the chat. 
uh, and this is relating to the funding. Um, maybe, maybe that's a question directed at Carly. Hello, yeah, good question. Um, okay, so at the moment, um, so we've set up basically on a shoestring. Um, so it's been really cool actually because, um, you know, the person that's designing the database on the website, he has rheumatoid arthritis. So there's been, we've, we've sort of brought the community together and done a lot of things cost or free um, because of the massive amount of resources that we've got within the, the patient community. So they've really pulled together to, to get to help me do some of the things that otherwise would have costed a lot of money to, to get off the ground. So I'm really grateful to them. Uh, we're going to need a little bit more funding to just make sure that the database uh, meets GDPR um, and all, eventually come 1st of November. And also I, what I'd really like to do is make sure that the cost of the card isn't significant because I think, you know, that's the reason why I'm doing this because, because patients are often low income. So I'd really like to subsidize the amount um, that patients are paying for the card who are on benefits or low income. So we have set up a crowd funder. So the majority of our funds will be just from donations um, and the rest will pull together um, and, and, so, and the community will help support us with, with services and things like that. So that's, that's how we're doing it. Thank you, Carly. Uh, thank you, Roshan, for, for the question. Uh, any any further questions? Okay, I see some some hands up. Hello. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Hi. So I'm Sarah Sinclair from Cannabis Health Magazine. Um, I just wanted to ask a question to Jason and Simon from a police perspective and also Carly from sort of the patient side of things. Um, how prevalent is it that medical cannabis patients are being criminalized for, for using cannabis? Um, so in my experience, I suppose, so the issue is that, that I've been working with the CPS on, on the, this for a while. And they hold figures, obviously, around how many people are being arrested for cannabis possession. But what we don't know, what we don't have figures on, is how many, how, what percentage of that proportion of people are claiming medicinal use. However, I, um, I obviously have a lot of contact with the community. So I'd say, you know, every day I, I might get six or seven patients message me in distress about the, their interactions with the police. Um, and you know that that's not because the police have done anything untoward i think a lot of the time the police are in a in a really tight situation and, and they are just doing what they feel um you know is is their job but i think that the the main issue really rather than the amount of people that are being physically arrested is the fear of it um and we all know that stress and anxiety can really really um perpetuate chronic health conditions it can it can make symptoms much worse and I think by far the biggest issue really is the fear of and, and the fact that sometimes that, okay, that, that fear occasionally stops people from doing things like going, you know, going to the shops because they can't take their vaporizer because so, so you know, there is a, um, there's a there is a, an issue with, with patients being arrested for sure, because I get I get that reports all day, all night. Um, but the, the wider issue is the fear, which is what which is what we're trying to to address, but also to try and help build um, build that community spirit up back between the patients and the police, which is something that, as Simon rightly said, has been has been a bit of a, a tricky thing to to negotiate. I don't know if Simon or Jason want to answer want to add anything. I think from uh, my point of view that. I haven't detail on the analysis or breakdown of uh, cannabis uh, interventions by police. Um, there are a number of schemes nationally. Um, uh, I, I don't want to go down the postcode lottery uh, route really, but there are various schemes available throughout the, the 43 police forces that um, who deal with cannabis very differently. You, you can get a cannabis warning, for instance, in, in one police area, uh, as opposed to, um, a, a, another form of diversion in another and what, what I'm trying to allude to or to, to highlight is is that this will provide a consistent approach to the medicinal user and I think it's that that the card really highlights and helps officers um, 
uh, determine their, 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 their uh, next steps. Uh, it also will change the, um, the, 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 the intervention from a punitive, you know, prohibitive uh, uh, intervention or, or stop or incident to a health-based, more, uh, uh, more sympathetic uh, uh, outcome. And I think it's that that's really crucial. You're dealing, what we're dealing with here is, is not a criminal. You know, we're dealing with a patient. And I think it's that that is that the card will highlight from the outset is that this is a medical issue, an, an, an incident, um, and, and, and certainly not a criminal one. As Simon mentioned before, um, organised crime will look to take up any opportunities they can. And it, again, the card will and may help um, uh, uh, point users to, or the can card holders to a, almost a database of um, uh, uh, knowledge and um, expert harm reduction uh, and probably for the first time uh, there will be incidents where users will uh, or patients will will purchase their their cannabis online uh, or from um, from uh, hostile environments uh, and it's that that's got to be you know managed and, and, and I think by implementing a, a careful a medicinal uh, approach to this is, is a very, very strong start. So um, I know it's a bit waffly on numbers. I haven't got that breakdown for you, but um, it'll be interesting to see if that was analysed. Thanks, Jason. And thanks for your question, sir. I think the only thing I'd, I'd build on from what Jason said there is, um, Carl is absolutely right. The, it's, it's really difficult to give a quantifiable answer to your question, Sarah because some things just aren't recorded or they aren't recorded in the same way uniformly across the country. Um, and it's absolutely right that we should front and center of this should be the lived experience of the patient. But there's also a lived experience of the police officer here as well. Um, and anecdotally, we're, we're brought into this real morally diff difficult area where we're having to deal with a patient in a way because the police officer um, wants to do what is seen as the right thing, but is also afraid of you know, being accused of um, disposing of evidence, not doing their job, not doing their duty, being complained about, because that's kind of the world we live in at the moment. Um, and what CanCard does is it just gives that confidence to the police officer, say, I'm dealing with a patient, it's not a recreational user. Parliament's already decided through the, the mechanisms on the in, in, in November 2018, Parliament's already decided we don't want these people to go through the criminal justice system. So this is just the police officer being able to carry out Parliament's wishes. That's that's how I see it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for the great question. I wonder if I can just add to that with a constituent experience. Um, uh, these prosecutions are happening. Um, and uh, the example I have in mind is uh, a case that came to my attention uh, just uh, uh, two months ago with uh, a, uh, a sufferer of Guillain Barr syndrome, um, uh, aged about 40, living with his, uh, in his, his mid-40s, living with his mother in a rural part of Wales. They had been known to me um, uh, from the time as they spent as, uh, as, my, as my constituents, thoroughly upstanding uh, family, um, uh, d mother, a distinguished public servant, and uh, uh, the, uh, the son had been a teacher, um, working a, uh, working in a uh, working in a school, but progressively disabled by his condition, had taken to had gone to live with his mother, who had retired to rural Wales, and the, uh, the distressingly the operational policy of the police and the prosecuting services there. Um, uh, didn't appear to take any account of the fact that if you ran a, uh, uh, a radio station broadcasting on the internet, as this um, uh, uh, gentleman did, his employment prospects having other been sufficiently disabled. Um, and you mentioned your, uh, your condition, and you get, he was sent cannabis from California by a, a fan of his radio station. Um, and uh, the border force area was to get terribly excited by the uh, customs by the fact this um, medicine was being sent in, in improperly and breached the regulations undoubtedly. Um, uh, but no one appeared in the uh, decision-making chain there to take any 
uh, uh, notice or have the time to take any notice um, of what his conditions were as to why uh, he chose to consume it um, uh, to relieve the symptoms of the neuropathy coming from his uh, uh, from his condition and uh, and having been as a law abiding citizen broken by the investigatory process um, then even with the opportunity to further contest it and take the case to a, a crown court where I think undoubtedly 12 of his peers in a jury would have declined to convict him. Um, he uh, took his chance in the magistrate's court in the part of the world that didn't appear to have a terrific understanding of what's at stake here. Uh, and that's where we need an operational police policy uh, across the country, supported by uh, a system like CANCARD, uh, that can uh, my apologies the uh, uh, system here for down just there uh, that's why we need a can card system that can get a consistent operational policy um, across the, uh, uh, the the United Kingdom where the police can have confidence that uh, if the government wants to prosecute recreational users um, that they operationally are able to do so and where they think it uh, makes uh, wider sense in terms of the uh, resources they have available to deliver it but not to prosecute people who the government do not intend do not want to criminalize in the first place which is those who um, are trying to find a medicine that is going to treat the symptoms uh, of the conditions they suffer. No, I hope that's... You're on mute, you're on mute, Bill. Thanks, Crispin. I was saying, thank, thank you, thank you, Carly. Uh, I say thank you for, for a real-world example of how CanCard would have helped um, somebody on, on the ground. Um, do we have any more questions for the panellists today? Hi again, it's um, Roisin here from the Cannabis Magazine. Um, thank you for answering my earlier question, Carly, and congratulations on such a great kind of uh, initiative involving so many different people from different kind of backgrounds. Um, I suppose this question could be for Dr. Barron um, or for Crispin Blunt, if you don't mind. With regards to CanCard and the amount of people it could potentially benefit in the UK, is the Department of Health or the NHS, are they aware of this um, and the potential in this for kind of furthering um, how we view medical cannabis and medical cannabis patients across the country? Uh, Leon, do you want to start? Well, um, to my knowledge, um, so <clears throat> there's actually, I think, a lot of work to do now um, on that side of things. Um, and that's, um, that clearly there's, you know, there's um, use systems or discussions to, to take place um, and um, I guess you know uh, my role is to sort of be there with Carly to sort of help her navigate that that process um, but I'm sure those discussions will need to take place um, you know I think from a from our from my perspective and from the primary care cannabis network really it it, it just comes down to, um, to to training doctors to understand and to be able to prescribe medical products so, um, you know, I, I personally, I don't see this as, as the ultimate solution. Um, and, um, but I do think that when you look at the, what's it, perhaps in the best interest of a specific patient at this moment in time, then this, this scheme um, offers some, obviously clearly some benefits, but um, ultimately, you know, I think that's really um, where we'll be um, sort of focusing our attention more so on how do we um, pro progress, um, uh, moving things forward in terms of education of doctors and opening up um, prescribing so that these patients that we're, we're referring to can actually be seen in medical clinics um, or GP surgeries and be prescribed medical regulated safe medical products. And the, you have to place uh, all of this in the context in which cannabis finds itself as a medicine. Um, uh, from 1961 when the world came together to prohibit um, all narcotic drugs and cannabis was placed in the most restricted schedule of all 
um, uh, almost entirely based on the rather appalling uh, racist approach to policing in the United States in the 1950s, where since black Americans were the principal users of cannabis, so obviously decided this, that this substance was entirely beyond the pale um, and therefore placed in the most restricted category of all, which meant that very little research um, was done into the uh, medicinal application of, of cannabis um, for the next 50 years. Uh, that uh, research was actually led in the end by G.W. Farmer in the United Kingdom under a license issued by Paul Boating for them to do research in specific areas in 1999. Um, as a result of those licenses, uh, those research licenses, um, G.W. Farmer now have a global lead um, and have produced uh, uh, two drugs that have been uh, approved under uh, European and American uh, regulations so far as I'm, uh, uh, I'm aware, just Epilidex and Sativex. Um, but of course, they've got a very significant investment in the intellectual property in those drugs. And the problem about a medicine derived from a plant is you, it's rather difficult to patent. Um, uh, you, can't, unless you can't patent it. And so uh, traditional pharmaceutical industries are uh, rather cautious about this area, about the amount of uh, money that they would in, in, invest in the space. And we have got to work out. And the traditional uh, pharmaceutical assessment process has got to work out how you properly assess cannabis-based medicines um, for their safety and their efficacy um, when it is not a single molecule um, being tested for its effect on a single disease with blind trials and all the rest of it in the traditional manner that you would have other, uh, other medicines. And that produces a challenge for the whole uh, pharmaceutical assessment process in the United Kingdom and indeed uh, everywhere. Uh, and if we're not going to, um, and so there is, uh, and we're still working out uh, how to make the, that assessment. And that's why the regulatory and legal framework under which medicine from cannabis sits is probably principally so muddled and why the medical establishment and the NHS is finding this rather difficult to deal with. Uh, not to mention the fact that they have not been taught about this over the last um, uh, half century or more, are not taught that there is an endocannabinoid system in, in every animal, um, which may be one of the reasons why uh, the medicine from this plant happens to work um, rather better than people might have anticipated. If they've not been taught about it and don't understand it, it's not uh, wholly surprising um, that the medical establishment, very conservative, um, particularly with the approach to drugs and everything else, with all the, uh, the history of uh, disasters like thalidomide and the rest, um, that that's the, those are the scarring experiences, um, which despite the fact that no one has ever died of a cannabis overdose, so far as I'm aware, um, that people are so uh, cautious uh, in this space around new uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, and we have to find a way to uh, it, if you like, change the regulatory environment and assessment environment under which uh, medicines based from cannabis uh, are treated with a, a profession and a health establishment um, uh, that, for, for which this whole business in that sense is alien from their, uh, their traditional experience. But in the end, uh, once we get this medicine within the pharmacopoeia reference books that doctors would then be able to use to know what medicines you can use to apply for uh, particular diseases and the symptoms of those diseases and uh, get it in a place where uh, Leon's colleagues r right across the National Health Service um, uh, are then have the confidence to know that there is uh, uh, that there's there are the references there's a supporting evidence that's, that's uh, that, that is that is all there in a way that is then uh, to the satisfaction of the uh, pharmaceutical regulators um, uh, then we will be in a place um, where can card won't be needed um, but things don't progress at uh, huge speed, uh, in the, in the, in the, particularly in the regulatory area, and it's because people are extremely cautious. And so for the time being, CanCard is, the, is absolutely the best idea I've seen that's available to then give the police the comfort um, to operationally manage this in an intelligent way, uh, therefore consistent with sustaining public support for our drug system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris Ben. Thank you, Leon. Um, do we have, we've probably got time for one more question, if anybody has another question. Um, maybe then for the 
Final couple of minutes, uh, Carly would like to say a few words um, and then we can close the, close the call at uh, 10.30. Brilliant, thanks Bill. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's, there's much more I can add. I mean, these guys have done an incredible job of explaining their position and explaining why they feel that patients should have the benefit of this and also why police officers and GPs should have the benefit of this service um, for them as well. So I just wanted to thank all of my panellists as well as of all of the attendees for coming. Um, we do have a crowdfunder available, that's on our website cancard.co.uk if anybody wants to link to that in, in anything that they're writing that would be great because um, we do need a bit of cash to, to set us off. Um, people can register to have their interest in the card today as of now, we've been getting applications since six o'clock this morning. Um, with the official opening date of November the 1st, which will mark two years since the law change. Um, so people will start to be able to officially apply as of then. So, so the first cards will be going out the day after that, so 2nd of November. Um, if you have any further questions or queries or anything, I guess you could get in touch with Victoria or Bill. Um, but I guess it's just for me now to wish you all a brilliant day and thank all of my fabulous panellists for just being brilliant. Uh, you've all done a really good job. Thanks for taking the time out of your day um, to listen to me and this lot go on. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, Carly. Thanks, Thanks Carly. Well done. Yeah. We'll close the meeting now. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.